Nobody, nobody talk or make any unnecessary noise like I'm doing. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. I'm the titular Sean. And I'm the very titular Carrie. And for the first time ever, we have a guest this week. We sure do. Tell me about him, Sean. Well, this man is a celebrated author. Uh, he also re- is a recently retired school teacher, uh, but we have him on here to give us his perspective on uh, a subject he's all too knowledgeable about, the ghosts of Gettysburg. We have with us uh, Caroline's father, my father-in-law, Paul Ferrante. How are you, sir? Great to be here and great to be the first guest on the Ain't It Scary podcast. Yes, it's a very esteemed position you hold right now. I feel esteemed. (laughs) Yeah, so um, this episode, you'll be telling us about some of the most haunted places in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, right? One of my favorite places and some place I've been visiting since I was a little kid. So tell me, uh, and Sean, I guess, a little of the, uh, of your backstory with Gettysburg. Why, what made you so fascinated with it? Well, I've been kind of a Civil War uh, aficionado since I was a a little boy. Went on my first trip to Gettysburg with a Cub Scout trip, I believe, (laughs) and have been back at least six times since then. Sometimes, um... With my wife, uh, sometimes with my wife and then my daughter Caroline, and sometimes to do research for books I was writing. So uh, I've been around the place quite a few times, and uh, it never ceases to amaze me because of its way of being steeped in history and American folklore. Now, on the subject of your books, uh, the very first book you wrote, you decided to set in Gettysburg, right? Right. It's called Last Ghost at Gettysburg, uh, a T.J. Jackson mystery. And it's the first in a series of uh, young adult paranormal mysteries um, featuring this character, uh, T.J. Jackson, and T.J. and his two friends, um, Bortnicker and Luann, who, by the way, lives in Gettysburg. Uh, start their career as ghost hunters with a case in Gettysburg and go on from there to have their own ghost hunting TV show a la Ghost Hunters or Ghost Adventures. And you know how we feel about the Ghost Adventures uh, listener. We're big Zach Bagans fans in this house. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I've told a few stories uh, over this time that we've had together on this podcast about my growing up and what made me the strange and spooky woman I am today. (laughs) Um, And I would say a lot of the fault lies with you, Dad, sorry to say, Uh, from telling me Walt Disney was frozen cryogenically while a child watching Disney movies to standing outside of the window in the dark and going (laughs) until I screamed, Uh, I grew up basically on the edge of my seat with fear constantly. Yeah, uh, no Disney World for you. (laughs) We we went to places like Gettysburg, and I'm sure they left an indelible mark on your psyche. Um, But, you know, it it was all in good fun. And uh, what better place to learn about American history than the scene of one of the epic battles, the turning points of the Civil War. Can I take us off topic, way off topic for just a moment? While we're on this subject, can we tell the story of the uh, ghost from the Long Island house? Yes. Uh, (laughs) The the, the Long Island house that my family bought as a summer cottage uh, was uh, originally built in uh, 1937. And uh, when we got there, there was a huge um, freezer in the basement that was um, disconnected by then. And uh, I convinced young Caroline that there was actually the body of the, uh, the original owner, Mr. Dillingham, uh, which was kept in the freezer. Oh, and- no. You said he was buried because it was an un- it's an unfinished basement, which was already kind of creepy and weird to me growing up in New England, where a lot of people have their finished basements or stone basements. But this basement has like a like a dirt 
area. Oh, yeah, he was moved. He's, he's buried there, and he murdered his wife, you told me, yes. as a child. Yes, he And did. put her in the deep freeze. Well, yeah. And Much like a Jeffrey Dahmer. <laughs> and, and then... and then Guys, he- I was in... I was like in preschool when I first heard this. <laughs> well, yeah, but he, what do you mean? Well, yeah, <laughs> he originally was in the deep freeze with her, uh-huh. but then when the deep freeze, you know, when we got rid of it, we had to move him. So he was moved to the crawl space uh, as you do. So he, this was a family decision it, to move yeah. him to the crawl space. He, what happened yes. to Mrs. Dillingham, who he murdered? Um, no comment. No comment. Wow. Yeah, so I grew up with these kinds of fucked up stories <laughs> since I was a child. And people ask, Carrie, why are you so morbid? And I say, because Dillingham murdered his wife and stuck her in the deep freeze. Well, when we got rid of the deep freeze, I, I think we also got rid of a wood chipper. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how that plays into it, but yeah. The conspiracy deepens. Sort of a Fargo situation with Dillingham there, I see. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, this is the kind of stuff that would really make my father smile growing up, just making me, oh my god! And um, I think also mixing history with that also was nice for you and bringing you to all these historical places. You were never someone who was interested in roller coasters or big-headed Disney mascots, but gosh, if we didn't go to Colonial Williamsburg when I was little. Right. Well, and that puts me in a mind to ask, uh, did your trips to Colonial Will- Williamsburg, to Gettysburg, uh, did these also involve convincing, impressionable young Caroline of of, uh, of ghost stories or ghost hunting adventures? Well, yeah, I mean, she liked all of that stuff. Um, <laughs> and she did get a real kick out of Colonial Williamsburg, even dressing up uh, as a as a little colonial girl to, oh. to my first cosplay yeah to the uh, to the point where people thought she was actually a reenactor because she, really, she really got into character but uh, you know just as a disclaimer we uh, we did do a, a side trip uh, on one of our early uh, excursions where we went to Hershey Park and uh, I took her on a roller coaster, and uh, as soon as it did a loop de loop, she said, "You know, I really hate this." <laughs> so after that, guys, I, it was my first roller coaster. I didn't know it went upside down. Right, that and was the so, secret from me. After that, we stuck to historical stuff, <laughs> and it was on to places like uh, the Tower of London and mm-hmm. and and other ghost stuff to the point where now. Where when we went to cities with her, we would absolutely have to visit. Uh, the cemetery, the the chief cemetery in each city, we would have to go on the ghost tour. And so, yeah, I did kind of create something there. (laughs) Um, Nothing wrong with that, though. And I love that you were too scared of the roller coasters. And so instead, it's the Jack the Ripper tour through Whitechapel or, or whatever. Yeah, I think we've, you know, talked about before how weird things creeped me out as a child. Or, you know, some understandable things like Large Marge from Pee-wee's Big Adventure. That's my brother. <laughs> my <laughs> that brother, was his fault. My brother got you on that. Um, but when it came to things like ghosts, it really just intrigued me and made me very interested. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it certainly does explain very much. And, you know, I remember our first trip to Gettysburg and hearing we did the uh, audio tour. We drove around everywhere and... You know, it's similar to like a Salem or or one of those kinds of places where the history there just feels heavy in the air. Um, it's just very weighty and very intense. And no matter where you go in town, it, you can't really escape that feeling. Yeah, and, as and I it's try fascinating. To, as I try to bring out in my in my book. Um, I would liken Gettysburg to a, a Civil War theme park. Um, the entire town is filled with attractions, whether they be museums, whether they be, be uh, bed and breakfasts, ghost tours, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And all of that stuff is is all well and good, but there's nothing quite just getting out on the battlefield, uh, especially to some of the less populated areas uh, at certain times of... Um, the day, especially uh, early evening or when it's getting dark, to really get a, a sense of what the place is all about. Yeah, I don't think it's. I don't think you most of the time can go out there at full dark, right? The battlefield's pretty much closed up. Well, you're not supposed to, right, <laughs> yeah, Caroline? I mean, 
you know, you're not supposed to. We have, but you're not supposed to. You know, my dad, uh, a teacher, uh, some would say very strict, but when it came to sneaking into places in the dead of night trying to find ghosts, he was a bad influence. Right. I mean, we, we snuck into a, an abbey uh, at, at around midnight and in the middle of uh, the town of Cashel in Ireland, a, a deserted abbey, and, and it's... Um, I don't think we can we can get arrested for this at this point. It's no, been at least statute a decade. of limitations. <laughs> at and least it's, it's been a decade it, or so. It had an adjacent, uh, you know, graveyard, and we, and we filmed the whole thing with a big camcorder, a la uh, Blair Witch, <laughs> w- which was very funny. And uh, when we got to Gettysburg, then uh, we did go out on the battlefield once uh, at night uh, because the first uh, motel we were staying in was actually. Um, on the site of Robert E. Lee's former headquarters on the battlefield. So we went out to some uh, places uh, at night. But then we decided, and this was also because I wanted to set the beginning of my book in the National Cemetery uh, of Gettysburg, we decided to um, to go there at night when we weren't supposed to be there. And it was quite an adventure, eh, Caroline? Yes, yes, it was. Um so mom was posted up in the front, our literal getaway car. And uh, yeah, so what happened, Dad? Well, we we, had, we told mommy to stay out front. And of course, we had a very inconspicuous car, uh, a bright red <laughs> minivan. Uh, so she was out there waiting and she kept saying, don't do this, don't do this. This is stupid. This is stupid. <laughs> And Caroline and I decided that we were going to get into the cemetery. So what we did was, um, you know, the cemetery, as is everything else in Gettysburg, is located really in the center of town because the entire town, as well as its environs, was the battlefield. So what we did was uh, she brought her camera and we walked along the uh, stone wall of the cemetery till we got to kind of a low point where we could actually hop the fence, which we did. So we we got over the fence. And so Caroline then uh, started snapping pictures because she thought, being the ghost little mini ghost hunter that she was, that she was going to get some orbs or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, then what happened to your camera, dear? Well, uh, for your orb photographs and things like that, usually you have a flash on and it was dark, so that made sense. And at one point, the camera just kind of fluttered with flashes. It seized up and uh, it stopped taking pictures. And I had charged it up specifically for this moment and it just, it didn't work for the rest of the trip. This was like one of the first nights of the trip. Um, this is a digital camera. And when we took it back home to Best Buy to get it looked at, they said, basically, I don't know what you did to this camera, but it's done. It is toast. It is broken. Too many ghosts. Too many ghosts. Well, that's the thing that happens. Um, whether you're filming with, with a, some sort of digital camera or you're taking pictures or even smartphones and things like that, some people say that the ghost or spirit or whatever there will drain your battery uh, trying to show itself or or get some energy from it. Yeah, it's something the Ghost Adventures boys seem to deal with a lot. Right. Yeah, and you would think they'd have good batteries, but... But our adventure, as it were, for the night wasn't over because once Caroline's (sighs) camera decided to get fried, here we are in this cemetery... And you would think, okay, time to go home. But no, because coming through the main gate, and there's only one entrance in and out of this (laughs) Driving past mom. Driving past mom, who was probably sunk down in her seat and laying on the floor of the the minivan, uh, was a a local, I don't know if it was a, a park ranger or if it was local sheriff, doing a sweep of the cemetery to make sure there were no trespassers so he comes creeping in the front entrance and he's got you know a regular police cruiser and attached to the top of it is a huge uh, searchlight and so there was really one big loop uh, of road you know one lane road that 
wove its way in a circle through the cemetery. So we took off and we were always about 25 yards ahead of this guy. It was a real Abbott and Costello yeah, so situation. <laughs> this is the Benny Hill theme. Yes. He's, he's crawling along and we're running from tombstone to tombstone, trying to stay ahead of him. And we just beat him out the gate. Uh, by maybe about 20 yards, we, go, 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 we go, ran go. to the car, we dove into the car, we, we yelled to my wife, hit it, and she stepped on the gas and patched out and took off. Like we were a bunch of bank and robbers. And she's like, you two are so stupid, you're so stupid, we could have got caught, you could have got arrested, you're a teacher, you should know better. But it was great. <laughs> it was it's a very lovely memory. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a strange little place. Uh, it's even it's strange at night. It's strange during the day, and the history of it all is what makes it what it is. So, Dad, can you um, kind of recap for us the Battle of Gettysburg, kind of the main points, and why it's such an important part of the Civil War? Sure. Well, Gettysburg was fought in uh, 1863 between the dates of July 1st and July 3rd. At that time, uh, the Union and the Confederate armies were more or less at a standstill. And um, Robert E. Lee had pushed his army of Northern Virginia as uh, far north as they would ever get. In fact, if they were able to uh, win this battle, they could have pushed on to Washington, D.C., and maybe uh, forced a, a, a treaty of some sort with, uh, with the Union. So this was kind of a key thing. And uh, this was the biggest battle that was fought in the North, you know, it was fought in Pennsylvania, because most of the Civil War was fought in the South, uh, in Virginia, Tennessee, uh, Mississippi, uh, you know, and, and the other Southern states. So this was Lee's big gamble to, to take this uh, uh, battle to get to Washington and to force a surrender or some kind of an armistice with the North. Uh, but what happened was they were intercepted at Gettysburg because Gettysburg was a crossroads. Uh, many, it was almost like the spokes on a wheel mm -hmm. that all met at the town of Gettysburg. And so... Um, Lee's army ran into uh, some cavalry uh, from the Union, and they got into some skirmishing. And before you knew it, both sides were gathering uh, for a big battle in this little town that was just, just a little farming town and nothing more than a crossroads. But before it was over, you would have thousands and thousands of uh, deaths or casualties Anywhere from 46,000 to 51,000, it is estimated. It, it was the single bloodiest battle ever fought on United States soil. And so this wasn't the result of like battle strategy by either army uh, maneuvering to get this, this battle to take place. This just, oops, uh, some fire ex is exchanged. And then all of a sudden we're having one of the biggest battles of the war here, I guess now. Right. It, it happened quite by accident. And, it, you know, it took three days the first two days, there was a lot of uh, back and forth uh, through various parts of the battlefield. It stretched for, uh, for quite a, a big area, some of it hilly, some of it flat, farmers' fields, and the town itself. And uh, before it was over, it was a, a really uh, a big turning point for the war. It was a calamity for the Southern uh, forces. They were forced to retreat after it was over. And it really kind of turned the tide of the Civil War. Yeah, so that kind of importance, that amount of bloodshed. Um, I mean, anywhere that a lot of people die really tragically, even one person, there's this kind of psychic energy that some say still persists there, even if it's not ghosts. Um, there's an energy there. And, I, you know, I swear to God, you can feel it in this place. There's just that heaviness of of what's come before, um, and it's it's pretty it's pretty intense to be there and experience that. Yeah, I definitely feel it when I'm in Gettysburg too. Uh, I just have less imagination, so I just call it the the weight of history or something. 
Yeah. So, but the thing about Gettysburg is along with um, reenactors, which is a very unique thing and, and possibly uniquely American thing, um, a lot of tourist shops and, and museums and things like that, this was the first place I ever saw ghost tours being given. And I think this is the first place we ever went on a ghost tour as a family, because what a better family activity to do. But, you know, as a, as a kid, I was probably, what, like nine or ten at the time, um, going to a place that was like, yeah, ghosts, let's go check out some ghosts, was literally the coolest thing ever. And, um, y- you know, it has kind of an industry around ghosts. Yeah, Gettysburg more or less invented the ghost tour industry and um if you go there now there are uh paranormal uh outfits there are ghost tours there are all kinds of uh shops selling books about haunted gettysburg etc etc so it's it's almost been an industry within an industry you have a lot of factions uh in gettysburg you have the ghosties uh, you have you have the hardcore historians. You have the reenactors who come in and actually do a three day battle reenactment on a neighboring farmer's field every year that draws thousands of reenactors and tens of thousands of spectators. Uh, so it is a real big deal, and uh, I was very fortunate to be um, a part of the one hundred and fiftieth. Uh, reenactment week uh, because uh, my book had come out and I was part of an author signing there. And it was really wild to be in a town where half of the people that you came in contact with uh, during the course of the day, whether you were doing a signing or just walking around town, were actually in full costume, you know, full period costume, in character, talking to you like they were army colonels or southern bells or something like that. And, you know, and they're like, so kind sir, would you please tell me what your book is about? And, and, you know, you're talking to these people. Probably the the funkiest thing that happened is there was a museum next door to where I was doing the signing. And I went to the bathroom and I'm in there and I'm at a urinal. (laughs) And this guy comes in next to me and he's like in full uniform. He's like in full union uniform so he's got a little bit of uh, a little bit of a project before he can do his business at the urinal then. <laughs> right he had to unbutton his his pant front because they didn't have zippers in those days and i didn't know what to say to him like do i talk to him like he's in the 1860s or do i talk to him like he's a guy in a costume at a urinal you know standing next to me i didn't know what to say so i, I just said like you know like Hey, uh, how you doing? <laughs> and he says, fine, sir. And then I said, oh, boy. All right. And then I got out of there. Still in character at the urinal. Still in character at the urinal. Shouldn't you be doing this that, like an outdoor trench somewhere? Yeah, he should be He should be peeing behind a tree. But no, <laughs> he went to the urinal. But, you know, but that's what it was like. It, It's a really, really different kind of place. And, of course, they have played upon... Uh, their place in history in a in a very big way, and that's what Gettysburg is all about today. So let's talk about some of the haunted locations in Gettysburg. Um, these are places that you'll see on like Travel Channel type shows, Discovery Channel, Ghost Adventures, Ghost Hunters. They're always making a stop in Gettysburg. So what are, what are the, some of the most haunted places in Gettysburg? Well, the places that come up time and time again, and these are places... We visited it at various times on our our trips. First, you have what's called the Jenny Wade House. Now, Jenny Wade, if you're not familiar, was the only civilian that was killed during the Battle of Gettysburg. She was this girl who uh, happened to be uh, in the kitchen baking bread at the time when a, a stray sharpshooter's bullet, because remember, the town was occupied. It was like street to street fighting. Uh, a bullet came crashing through and and, and killed her. Uh, this is supposedly one of the most haunted places. It's been featured on Most Haunted Live from England. It's been presented on a show called Ghost Lab. And, uh, you know, people say, or the thing, you know, the idea is 
that the ghost of poor Jenny Wade is still there in the kitchen, baking some bread, haunting the place. You know, again, like all of the thousands of soldiers, this was a girl who, uh, a young girl who had her whole life ahead of her, who was kind of ripped from this earth in a very tragic way. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting. She was, I think, in her late teens, early 20s. Um, she was, I think, you know, baking the bread, trying to help out, uh, trying to help feed the soldiers. And it's such a sad, sad, tragic story. And, you know, of course, her soul might still be attached to the place where she was killed. She might not even have known what was happening when it happened. Um and, of course, the Ghost Adventures boys, with their classic uh, tact and dignity, went over to the house and tried to see if Jenny had anything to tell them. Uh, she might have been dating a soldier at the time who was killed in the battle. That's kind of a classic part of a lot of these stories. So um, let's see what the boys had to say to Jenny. What do you have to drink? Do you want to do EVP, guys? Yeah. yeah. Hang on real quick. Just, just wait, wait, it. water. It just said, give us a drink of water. Like a soldier, bro. Look, he looks like a soldier with a backpack. You oh, do you think she you thinks that I'm a soldier? So, <laughs> so that's how the Ghost Adventures boys dealt with that. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's a fascinating place. And uh, it really kind of brings home the idea of this taking place in the middle of people's lives in the, in the middle of the town. You think of battles as something far off, at least for us, that's been kind of the experience of war, luckily. But this was, this really affected everything. Well, many of the bigger buildings in town, including churches, even people's homes were turned into makeshift hospitals uh, where they were trying to care for the wounded. And so really the, the, the whole town uh, became involved in this, you know, mo many people were just, you know, hiding in their cellars till it all blew over. But above them, uh, the whole town was a battlefield. And medical treatment for a lot of anyone injured in a civil war battle was often just amputation, right? Right. Because they had no way of, of, uh, of dealing with, uh, any kind of, you know, saving bones or setting, you know, setting bones and stuff like that. They were always afraid of uh, infection. You know, more soldiers probably died of infection and disease in the Civil War than died of gunshot wounds. They had they had no they didn't know about uh, sterilization yet, really. And so the easiest way, if a person was hit with a bullet that that hit bone that shattered bone, uh, was to cut off the entire limb entirely and try to stitch it up and hope the person wouldn't die of infection. So. Uh, some of these places, you know, uh, in town and whether it was out on the battlefield, um, you know, you'd, you'd see the tents or the, the rooms where they were doing the surgery, if you want to call it that, one after another on the same table. You know, you see the doctors just splattered with blood using, you know, hacksaws, etc. And, you know, piles of limbs outside. Uh, stacking up. And it, it's really a gruesome, gruesome thing. And for these people who lived in this little town where nothing ever happened, uh, this was uh, this was just like, it must have seemed like the end of the world to these people. Yeah, it's this sort of deep set trauma that I don't think has ever left. Um, when we went on that first ghost tour back in the day, they were telling a story in the town of one of the places that had been turned into a hospital. I think it had, might have been originally a school. And the tour guide was like, yeah, and they would cut off everyone's limbs. And eventually they would just throw them out the window just to get them out of the room. And there were so many like limbs, you know, arms, legs uh, piling up that you could walk across the road on them like a bridge. And me, little 10-year-old, was like, holy shit, this is the craziest thing I've ever heard. Yeah, by the time of the end of the battle, there were bodies, there were bodies everywhere strewn over the acres of land and you know, farmers' fields and everywhere in between. There were, there were bodies everywhere that needed to be buried. There were bodies of cattle, bodies of horses. And this was July, and everything was decomposing in the hot 
summer sun and a stench hung over the town for months and months, it was said. And of course, eventually the national battlefield was established uh, where Caroline and I happened to <laughs> hop the fence, where um, Abraham Lincoln in November of 1863 would um, give his famous Gettysburg Address. Yeah. So, I mean, he even made an appearance, uh, you know, here and there, there are stories of, oh, we saw Lincoln's ghost. It's like, okay, well, sure. But yeah, it's it's just one of those places. Um, so what what's the next uh, crazy haunted place? Well, another crazy haunted place, and this is a place we uh, we visited actually a few times. It's called Devil's Den. Now, Devil's Den was in a hilly area of the battlefield, a str very strategically um, valuable area. And Devil's Den was really, uh, a, uh, and is, a warren of huge boulders that are kind of, uh, you know, piled on top of each other haphazardly, creating all these kinds of nooks and crannies and little tunnels. And uh, what you had was sharpshooters for both armies at times occupying this area and, you know, picking off uh, the opposing soldiers uh, from this position where they were kind of, you know, sheltered away and safe. And um, there were famous pictures that were taken of Devil's Den afterwards, especially there's a very famous Matthew Brady picture of a Confederate sharpshooter who's laying um, in this in one of these little hollows of, of rocks with his gun propped up against, uh, you know, one of the boulders. Now, of course, we were to learn later that this entire photo was actually staged by Mr. Brady, which was a common practice back then. Nevertheless, the entire Devil's Den area uh, is supposedly haunted by the ghosts of the sharpshooters for both sides, which brings me to a very interesting little story. And this happened when Caroline was little. So we go to Devil's Den, me and my wife and Caroline. And so we're walking around and there's all, like almost nobody there. Okay. Nobody there. And then all of a sudden, as we're walking around, this guy walks up to my wife and I, and the guy is completely in union battle dress. Now, from his outfit, he seemed to be uh, cavalry. Um, he had the lighter blue pants with the yellow stripe down the side. He had the knee boots. He had um, the French-style kepi cap. He had the kerchief. So I got the impression that he was dressed as cavalry. And he made very small talk with us, but he didn't when he talked to us, he didn't talk about anything, you know, like modern. Um, it's not that it, he was staying in character necessarily, but he didn't say anything that would give away the fact that he was supposedly from modern times. So suddenly he, you know, he, he bid us good day and he went on his way and he started walking away. And then we turned around and he was kind of gone. And so to this day, my wife is convinced, Maria is convinced that he was a ghost. Now he seemed very flesh and blood to me, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, this is the kind of thing that it makes you wonder when you're in a place like that. For example, like one, like what's somebody doing walking around in a civil war uniform, uh, you know, on a regular summer day, no reenactments going on, no reenactments. And this going was April. On. I think this was Goes a spring April. break one. So okay, it's not even break. like there was something yeah. set to happen. So is this guy just a nutbag or what Could is he? Be. You know, and he didn't, um, so he didn't give it, make any giveaway comments like y'all see that new Richard Gere movie or anything like that. <laughs> How about them Yankees? Yeah. No. Um, I took a picture or I think I took the picture of him with mom. So that's hanging around somewhere. And I remember as a kid being a very curious little kid, I followed him uh, a little ways away and he went, walked behind one of the giant boulders. And when I turned the corner of the boulder, this sounds like I'm making it up, but I didn't. Uh, he wasn't there. 
And so we're on the top of the Devil's Den, and you look down and you can see a whole parking lot area. Um, but he, I never saw him walk down there. I never saw him leave. I just saw him go around the corner of one of the boulders and just disappear. Yeah, that's so that's our Devil's Den story. Devil's <laughs> Den is definitely one of the most dramatic and compelling sites. And uh, if you if you go online and you you know just type in most haunted places in Gettysburg, uh, invariably Devil's Den is going to come up. Well, they were kind of asking for it, calling it Devil's Den. <laughs> there's a there's a state park with that name in Connecticut. It wasn't like Happy Meadow or something. That's right. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's take a little break, and when we come back, we'll talk about some more of the most haunted places in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. <laughs> This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Lots of things are a struggle right now. School, work, even something as simple as going to the grocery store, it could feel overwhelming. But one thing that shouldn't be overwhelming is accessing mental and emotional care. That's where BetterHelp comes in. BetterHelp is the leader in online counseling with over 4,000 licensed counselors on the site and over 500,000 people who have gotten counseling to date. The mission of BetterHelp is to make professional counseling accessible, affordable, and convenient, so anyone who struggles with life's challenges can get help anytime, anywhere. I've been using BetterHelp for the better part of this year, and honestly, I don't know how I would have gotten through 2020 without it. And, of course, Sean and Poe. When I need to talk to my counselor, I can just text her and I can schedule chats, phone calls, or video calls for longer sessions. This means I have flexibility to set a session during the week, or during busy weeks, I can just shoot her a message here and there when I have time. Take control of your mental and emotional well-being. BetterHelp is a great place to start. For 10% off your first month's subscription of BetterHelp, go to our podcast link at www.betterhelp.com slash scary and see how good it can feel to push past the struggle and find hope in a new day. That's www.betterhelp.com slash A-I-N-T-I-T-S-C-A-R-Y for 10% off your first month of BetterHelp. Get professional counseling anytime, anywhere, because you deserve to be happy. Welcome back. Today we are going through some of the most haunted places and, um, I was going to say places and locations, some of the most haunted places in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, the site of probably the best known battle of the Civil War. Uh, and we're here with Carrie's father, Paul Ferrante, my father-in-law. That's how that works. Yeah. Uh, and w- what do we have next? Well, Gettysburg College is actually a very famous uh, haunted site. And Gettysburg College, like everything else around Gettysburg, is on the battlefield. It was there uh, during the battlefield. Uh, there are some other buildings like uh, the Lutheran Seminary that are there. Um, but Gettysburg College at the time was used uh, as other buildings as a field hospital. And uh, there have been many sightings of ghosts by students, faculty, um, people who worked on staff at the college over the years. Probably the most famous one that is uh, come up again and again on various ghost shows. And, I, you know, I saw this one on Travel Channel. And it's been featured by um, a guy by the name of Mark Nesbitt, who uh, has really uh, been ahead. Of, he was way ahead of the curve as far as Gettysburg ghost tours and stuff like that. He is considered the preeminent Gettysburg ghost historian. And um, this story involves somebody who was um, either a part of um, the personnel of the college or a student, depending on the story, the version of the story that you hear. And uh, earlier, you know, um, in the 20th you know, century or so, um, there were elevators put in one of the buildings uh, of the college. And uh, this uh, young lady got on the elevator and uh, went down to the bottom floor. And upon reaching the bottom floor, 
the doors of the elevator opened and she was not in a storage room or whatever was expected to be at that destination, but she was actually looking in on um, a Civil War operating, you know, a medical theater with doctors performing uh, these amputations and men screaming, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, this is a time slip situation. Yeah, time slip situation. Uh, the person, and apparently, uh, according to the story, one of the doctors started walking toward this person who staggered back onto the elevator, went back up, got people to come down to look at it, and when they got back down there, there was nothing there but an empty space. So I'll do a time slip of my own to the fifth grade, and <laughs> me telling my father that we're starting the Civil War unit in uh, elementary school. He's very excited because he's always been a Civil War buff. So, of course, he records this very show on the Travel Channel for us to watch uh, later on, and we watch it. And when the Gettysburg unit came up, I raised my hand to my teacher and I said, I know something about Gettysburg. And she says, what is it, a young Caroline? And I say, well, and I told that whole story to my whole class. And my teacher was weirded out by, <laughs> by that. Um, but I, I thought it was relevant to our education. And I still do. It was definitely relevant. <laughs> Great story. <laughs> and, and probably the last place I, I want to mention here, and, and it really isn't a a battlefield uh, site per se, but it's called the Haunted Orphanage. Now, this place was in the middle of town, and uh, this has also been featured on Ghost Adventures with the famous Zach Beggins. Uh, what happened with this orphanage was that it was established for children who were orphans of uh, Union soldiers. Oh. And so these kids were brought there. Unfortunately, a person by the name of Rosa Carmichael was put in charge of this orphanage, and uh, she went on to uh, systematically terrorize and torture a lot of the poor kids who were in this orphanage, locking them downstairs in uh, dungeon-like uh, rooms, chaining them to walls, putting them in uh, vats of water and nearly drowning them now, uh, now, until until she was found out and dismissed. Now, Paul, you went to Catholic school. Yes. <laughs> How did that compare? Uh, well, you know, it was kind of on a par, actually. <laughs> uh, but un unlike myself and uh, some of my friends, uh, these kids, these poor kids really couldn't fight back. So... Um, this was a, a really, really terrible, terrible place. And of course, Ghost Adventures made the most out of playing up this, uh, this terrible Rosa Carmichael. So not all the places in Gettysburg uh, are, are battlefield sites. And there, there are some other haunted inns. There are, you know, there are many, many sites uh, considered to be haunted in the Gettysburg area. Yes. Yeah, so, it, you know, if you go on any of the ghost tours, you're going to hang out at Gettysburg College for a while. And of course, the time slip story is the most famous. It's it's probably in like the first book of the very long Ghosts of Gettysburg series. Um, but Gettysburg College, you know, it's constantly in the top of all of the most haunted universities in the world. We have Campus Explorer calling it the third most haunted college in America. Uh, so there's a ton going on there. And along with the time slip, we have a couple of my other favorite stories. We have uh, Brewer Hall, which is an area on the campus originally constructed as the college chapel. Did you say Bruja Hall? Brewer. Not bruja. Not like Mexican witches out there. No. So this was originally the chapel. So it has like a bell tower, turrets. It's got a, all the flying buttresses you could want in the world. Ooh. <laughs> and eventually it was tr uh, transformed into the college theater, which is called the Klein. And it's also got an additional smaller theater, the Stevens. 
Now, below the Klein stage is an area called the catacombs, which isn't creepy at all. And the most famous ghost, what? You can't stop there. Why is it called the catacombs? Are there are there corpses in it? Unfortunately, no. It's just a creepy, weird underground place. But uh, there is a ghost at Brewer Hall who is called the General. I know him. He got me my insurance. I called him. I saved some uh, time. You're an idiot. No. <laughs> He's just called that. No, my buddy Shaq told me about him. He's a four foot high cartoon. Shaq? That doesn't seem correct. Yeah, Shaq does commercials for the general now. <laughs> Let's pour one out for Shaq. And uh, so this spirit is so well known that his legend was actually confirmed by a friend of mine who attended Gettysburg several years ago and was part of the theater department. And basically the whole deal with the general is that he's an elderly gentleman wearing the uniform of a general officer, Civil War era. Um, he is often seen seated among the audience during rehearsals and performances. And uh, just like many creepy old men, he apparently has preferences for particular young actresses and makes it a point to show up for all of their performances. And l let it be noted that we actually visited Gettysburg College when Caroline was looking at, at schools. And if they had been offering exactly the program that she was looking for, I guarantee she would have enrolled right on the spot. And yet, you know, she was very taken with the whole place. It was it was a wonderful visit and everything, uh, except for the fact that, I don't know if it was, was it in the theater or? It was in the theater building because I wasn't sure, I wasn't totally sure if I was doing theater or film and Gettysburg didn't offer film, which is why I didn't end up going there, but we were in the theater building and... Caroline proceeded to fall down the stairs. Perhaps I was pushed, who knows? Paul, you pushed her? <laughs> oh, no, a ghost. I see. Okay. Uh, hopefully not the general. Hopefully he liked the cut of my jib. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I really... It was bad. It hurt a lot. <laughs> For the showing up during performances, I wonder if there's just some old creep in Gettysburg. We know apparently people there like to just dress up in military uniforms and wander the woods. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure that's happened. But I think he sometimes shows up on the stage or in the backstage area. It's always the same guy. You would think that eventually he uh, wouldn't be showing up anymore. But nope, he's always there. Uh, Gettysburg also has its own woman in white. Uh, the story here kind of is, I don't know wonky but basically she committed suicide over a broken lover's pact or he might have been killed in the battle of gettysburg so she threw herself off the top of gettysburg college and she's apparently been seen floating above the ground near the pennsylvania monument at the college especially Espe after frat parties after frat parties could that have anything to do with whatever's in those red cups at those frat parties more so than the the activity on the other or maybe that's just when people tend to go up on the roof well i know they that absinthe is called the green fairy because sometimes you hallucinate a green fairy so maybe whatever natty light they're drinking uh it makes them hallucinate a, a dead civil war era wo woman in white they would be drinking yingling oh true that oh these are these are classy frats yes <laughs> Uh, yeah, and the last major story at Gettysburg College is of the Blue Boy, who is said to haunt Stevens Hall. So this area used to be a girls' school. Now, it, a lot of these things said it is said, so I don't know if it's confirmed, but apparently this area used to be a girls' school named Pennsylvania College Prep School. And one winter night in a dorm, a young boy had fled from his abusive home and found kind students there willing to give him some shelter, some, you know, young girls. When the headmistress of the school knocked on the door to talk to the girls, they hid him outside their window because they weren't supposed to have any people, especially boys, in their room. And they weren't able to let him back in for another hour. And it was a cold winter's night. So they opened the, the window up and he was gone. And some versions of the story say that they saw footsteps in the snow and possibly far down from where the window was. But either way, apparently, 
Young women nowadays studying at the college see the spirit of a blue-faced boy outside the windows of Stevens Hall, kind of floating around Salem's lot style. And sometimes he even writes the words, help me, backwards on the frosted window panes in the winter. If you're living on that campus and you're not minimum writing help me backwards on frozen window panes in people's uh, windows, you're nuts. What are you doing? You're wasting an opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. But I think some of these uh, windows are, are several stories up. Now that's creepy. Uh, so they weren't al- in this story. They weren't allowed to have this small child in, in their dorm. It's not like there's hanky panky going on. <laughs> I don't know how young he was or how young the girls were. You know, if they were all like middle school aged, that might have been an issue. But he's called a boy. So maybe he was just boyish in countenance. Who knows? Oh, yeah, that's a good point. It could have been uh, Ryan Reynolds. He's very boyish. So, yeah. So the last uh, place that I'll, I'll chat about here is one of my favorite places to go to. And we always stop there for a nice uh, bite to eat is Farnsworth House. Now, you kind of included Farnsworth House, Dad, in your book, right? Yeah, the first time uh, I went to Gettysburg uh, with your mother, uh, we went to Farnsworth House for dinner, and it was really, really nice. Uh, Very period authentic, all of the dishes, all of the drinks, uh, the decor. Farnsworth House was actually there during the battle. It actually has bullet holes uh, embedded in the in the outside walls, they'll cut your leg off on the way out if you give them a little a good tip. It, if you fail to give them a good tip, <laughs> they, they might do a quick amputation on you. But the the cool thing about it about Farnsworth House was, at least when we went the first time, that after dinner, they had a reenactor who was upstairs in what they call the garret, which is what we would call an attic. And during the battle, uh, sharpshooters stationed themselves up in that attic and uh, were picking off people from that window. As a matter of fact, a sharpshooter was killed up there, and they later later did the the luminescent uh, test uh, on the floorboards. Oh, like on a hotel mattress. Uh, Yeah, that kind of a thing, and and they found... (laughs) And they found, you know, blood stains from from way back. But uh, there was a person up there who was in Civil War dress, uh, who was dressed as a soldier, and uh, told us his account of the battle, et cetera, et cetera. So when I wrote the book, I decided that I would um, make one of my three main characters. Or her name is Luann Darcy, and she's a teenager. Uh, and she is coincidentally the the daughter of one of the park rangers. Uh, Luann works part-time as a reenactor doing that very same thing in the garret uh, of a place, and I renamed it Charney House, but it's really Farnsworth Inn, and, you know, telling the story from the perspective of the townspeople who were uh, more or less terrorized for three days and afterwards when this battle just kind of washed over them. Yeah, so during the Battle of Gettysburg, you know, the Farnsworth house was taken over by Confederate forces because it was a pretty ideal structure to use as a makeshift hospital and headquarters. Uh, They thought that they could possibly be picking off the Union soldiers as they headed down Cemetery Ridge. So during the third day of battle, Union soldiers overtook the house and they just killed many of those snipers posted inside, just like you said, with the main sharpshooters being upstairs And so the Schultz family, who owns the property today, claims that 16 or more spirits are stuck to the home, including a young boy, several soldiers, and a midwife. Now, as we know, the soldiers kind of make sense. Okay, there were a bunch of soldiers there. A bunch of soldiers died. Um, And apparently they still roam the house, kind of stuck in a loop from what they had been doing during the battle. Now, usually there's... Uh, an attribution to a ghostly midwife where guests sometimes report being tucked into bed under one of the covers by a present, a presence that they can't see. And there are also a lot of photographs that have been captured of an entity in the window of the Sarah black room, which is supposed to be the most haunted room in this very haunted place. 
there's also just a lot of reports by like guests and employees about the sound of heavy breathing, the strong scent of cigars, the sound of a Jew's harp being played. Now I checked to make sure that that was okay to say. It's also called a mouth harp. Mouth harp, if you're more comfortable with that. <laughs> yes. Uh, being played in the empty attic throughout the night. Maybe this could be our dead sharpshooter trying to keep himself company. And there's disembodied footsteps up and down. But of course, and the sensation of being followed around while working, but no one is there when you turn around. Now, there's been apparitions seen everywhere, and one particular one is of an older woman dressed in 19th century clothing that kind of roams between the halls and the tavern and the kitchen. And she seems to be sort of looking at the shelves and taking stock and maybe thinking about what she'd serve that evening. She frequents the restaurant area and sometimes acts rudely to the waitstaff, like grabbing the apron strings of one of the employees so hard she almost fell backwards. So perhaps she uh, she was a cook and she just doesn't like how they're doing things nowadays. Yeah, Farnsworth House, great place to visit. And I would think that maybe uh, for an anniversary, you know, romantic weekend away, you two guys might want to check it out. I think we probably will at some point. That sounds right up our alley. And also, I know Caroline uh, wants to ride horses on the battlefield. Yes, absolutely. And anywhere that you can go and see a ghost just screams romance to me naturally. So there's that. So it's it's in the queue after Centralia, Pennsylvania, the mine, <laughs> the mining town with a fire underneath it for 30 years. And a fire in our hearts, Sean. So, Dad, um, what what really made you decide to go into the paranormal category for your books because spoiler alert audience uh, my dad will never say that he believes in ghosts or not he's very cagey about it i i like to think that he's developed his beliefs on this over the many years he spent with me haunting his life but um what made you write a, a paranormal book and why did you set it in gettysburg to start out with well i i as caroline has told you you know, she grew up watching a lot of these crazy shows with me, ghost hunters, ghost adventures, ghost just about anything. For someone who doesn't believe in ghosts, you sure love a ghost show. Yeah, I mean, they're ent they're entertaining and uh, you, you learn a little history along the way, but it's mostly for entertainment. And of course, some of the hosts are a little more dramatic than others. So when I wanted to start this young adult series, the T.J. Jackson Mysteries, I decided to make TJ and his two friends, uh, Bortnicker and Luann, um, teenage ghost hunters who uh, would eventually have their own cable show, uh, a, a kind of a junior version of Ghost Adventures. In fact, their mentor uh, in, in the series, a guy by the name of Mike Weinstein. Who uh, coincidentally is one of our patrons for this podcast. Hi, Comfy Mike. Uh, didn't know if I ever told you that, but my dad stole your name for this character in his book. So there you go. That's right, Mike. I never forgot you. So we, <laughs> I put you in there, and really, you are the uh, kind of Zach Bagan's mentor to the kids as they get into the whole ghost hunting thing. So anyway, I decided what better way to start the series than to combine my love of uh, all this ghost hunting craziness with uh, th this famous site of Gettysburg, which I knew very well. As a matter of fact, besides doing the, uh, you know, the, the cemetery thing with Caroline and walking out on the battlefield at night, we also drove around the entire town with a camcorder, just recording all the streets, seeing what it looked like to, to walk around. I wanted it to be totally accurate. We went to the visitor center, we went to the museums, we went everywhere, and uh, I think it has a real flavor, uh, gives you a real flavor for the town. And it's really, uh, in addition to being a good, I think a really good ghost story, it's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful travelogue. In fact, I've had students of mine who went uh, with their parents or siblings, especially kids uh, who were visiting Gettysburg College who had older uh, siblings who were thinking of going there and taking my book along with them and, and looking for all the sites that were mentioned in the book. 
and saying, oh yeah, I found this, I found that, I saw this, I saw that. So if you ever really want to get a, a good feel for the place with a little paranormal hijinks thrown in, uh, Last Ghost at Gettysburg is is a good read. Yeah, and uh, well, a couple of things. For, first of all, I just for, for Comfy Mike, I, I haven't seen a Sean McCabe pop up in one of these uh, books yet, so I'm still waiting on that. Oh no, Mike Weinstein is a much bigger character than the Caroline character is to the point where I don't think I'm ever like in a scene. Meanwhile, Mike Weinstein is a, a sweet and a lovely man that pops up in almost all of the books, if not all of them. Well, he's basically Zach. I mean, he, he is Zach. Uh, so my, you know, he's very dashing. He's very funny. He's very over the top. And, uh, I, you know, Mike should read the book and I uh, hope he approves. <laughs> Uh, second thing, they are all, they're all kind of like that in the travelogue uh, sense. All the TJ books are, are places that you've loved going. Yeah, they start off in Gettysburg. They hunt pirate ghosts in Bermuda. They go to Cooperstown, uh, where they encounter the ghost of Roberto Clemente. They As you do. They encounter, <laughs> they encounter a female witch in my former residence of Fairfield, Connecticut during uh, Fairfield's witch trials. They go down to New Orleans for, for some good old voodoo and Marie Laveau. And uh, most recently, coming out this summer, they are going to be in the Tower of London with all the crazy uh, royalty characters running around there with their heads chopped off. Do we get a Jack the Ripper tour mention in there? Yes, they, <laughs> they do go on a Jack the Ripper tour, which, of course, we had to bring Caroline on when we went to London as well. It was so freaking cool. Yeah, you know, I would tell you this even if you weren't my beloved father, but I, I really love the books. They're the kinds of books that I adored as a kid. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of glad that this sort of paranormal trend in YA uh, has increased because I didn't I never had enough to to read. These books kind of remind me of um, this series called the Sebastian Barth Mysteries by James Howe, who wrote Banicula, which is kind of a kid's book but these were more YA books. Um, and, you know, there was just never enough of like the cool paranormal stuff with like really interesting kid characters that I could relate to. And even nowadays, you know, I'm, n I'm never above reading a YA book. And n these are all really, really great. And they teach you a lot. I learned a lot about voodoo, um, which I promise I'm not using on you, Sean. <laughs> uh, a lot about Roberto Clemente. Um, yeah, and and last goes to Gettysburg. It was it was a trip to to read it and to to read all the places that we'd been to. And I've been back since the book came out and kind of going back and tracing the kids' route and meeting all the ghosts. Well, that's what's cool about ghosts in the context of these books is um, it's like there are there the ghosts are a hook to convince kids get kids over that hurdle of history being boring, which it's not. History is one of my favorite things. Right. This was my way writing the books, especially when I was still teaching, was, you know, to get kids to slip history to kids without hitting them over the head with it. Because I think the last thing the kids want to read in general at that age is nonfiction. So by making it into a paranormal mystery and having the, having my teenage uh, characters come in contact with uh, people from the past so they could tell their story or the kids could do research and learn about these stories. Uh, I think this was a great way to get history across to the kids. Plus, they're really, really fun stories. The kids are likable. They're relatable. And, uh, you know, it's got a little bit of everything for everybody. In fact, a lot of the reviews I get online um, on Amazon and other places are from adults who read it just for the history aspect and learned a lot from it. So there's a little something for everybody, but uh, hey, who doesn't love a ghost story? Well, I obviously do, and a lot of that is thanks to you. So thanks for all the, the trauma and the smiles uh, growing up with all of the strange, strange stories and the fun history that I got to experience. Now, you can find my father, Paul Ferrante. Uh, you can find him on his author site on Amazon, and all of his books are available there on Kindle and in paperback. You can find him at paulferranteauthor.com. Uh, that's P-A-U-L-F-E-R-R-A-N-T-E 
Author.com. And uh, you could actually find him at Paracon with us in Ansonia, Connecticut, July 24th and 25th. Mm-hmm. Yes, at July 24th and 25th. So that's just, gosh, just over a month from now. He'll have his own booth there because he is a paranormal author. And we are just a couple of podcasters living the dream. Right, Sean? Oh, yeah. Living it. <laughs> so yeah, so uh, so you can see my dad there. You could pick up the books there, or of course Amazon, Barnes and Noble, wherever you get you, you get your books. And we have um, we have the next T.J. Jackson Terror in the Tower uh, novel coming out very soon. Is there anything else you want to plug, Dad? No, Tower of London. That that'll be the next one. Uh, I do have a, another book coming out, but uh, be, besides the T.J. Jackson book, which is more of a um, uh, a social commentary, young adult type story that'll be out also in August. I've also done a a, a book uh, regarding the Beatles, uh, a fiction book that takes place in 1966. Again, historical fiction, but if you love the Beatles and who doesn't, uh, I think you'd really love that book. It's called Thirty Minutes in Memphis, and um, so yeah. But the the paranormal thing is is a lot of fun. And uh, I, I'm going to stay with it because, it, you know, one story leads to another and there are so many great venues and uh, historical characters to explore. Now, did in writing the Tower of London one, did you already get the bug for the next one? Like, ah, oh, you know what I got to do? Well, Caroline is always feeding me. <laughs> she's always feeding me uh, ideas. So you never know where the I, next I literally did this yesterday, too. Yeah. So, so I, you never know where the next one's going to be. But Tower of London... Again, someplace we visited with Caroline is uh, is a lot of fun, and you're going to learn a lot of history about a lot of dead royals. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so that's my dad, Paul Ferrante. Thanks for being with us, Dad. A lot of fun. It was great. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, we'll try to uh, suck away some more of your time when uh, we cover Paul is Dead or, uh, or some similar Beatles uh, uh, mythology. Yeah, and listen, Caroline, the next time you come over... Um, you know, don't, don't get freaked if I ask you to just go downstairs and check out something in the freezer for me. Um, oh God, <laughs> mom, know. it's mom. killing him. It's killing him. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah, find dad at paulferranteauthor.com on Amazon and at Paracon where you can ask him if he believes in ghosts and Hey, he might just answer the truth. He won't answer. He won't answer. <laughs> Connecticut's first ever paranormal convention is coming this summer. Paracon! Paracon will be held Saturday and Sunday, July 24th and 25th, 2021, at the Haunted Ansonia Armory in Ansonia, Connecticut. And guess who's going to be there? This Haunted Weekend will feature special guests, paranormal investigations, seminars, panels, vendors, exhibits, and much, much more. Paracon is presented by Nick Grossman, head of Ghost Storm Investigations and collector of some of the rarest paranormal artifacts in the world, and Charles Rosenay, founder of Stratford's Fright Haven and director of Tours of Terror, ghost tours to Transylvania, Prague, England, and all over haunted Connecticut. Yeah, we've been to Fright Haven. Uh, when we went, he had a... One, one of the rooms was... Uh all clown themed it was a bunch of scary clown stuff but you wore 3d glasses it was pretty cool that was the saint valentine's day massacre wasn't it Uh, yes they do seasonal offerings not just halloween that was the saint valentine's day massacre it was a beautiful date our first valentine's day so who will be at paracon guests include paranormal investigator barry pirro Author Bill Hall, who you may remember wrote The World's Most Haunted House, subject of episodes 17 and 18 of the podcast. Yep, go check those out. Some of our very best work, Mm -hmm. I think. And us. Yeah, we'll be there too, in person to chat all things scary. So come on down and meet us. I guess I spoiled your surprise there. But yes, we will have a booth at Paracon and we're so damn excited that we'll be there. Yeah. Do you like to shop? Well, they'll have their own bizarre bazaar. Haunt artists, horror authors, cryptozoologists, artisans, 
cult sellers, and much more will be there, so bring some bones, the money kind, and a good pair of walking shoes. You can bring the other kind of bones, too, if you if you want. Yeah, maybe you can sell them. Who knows? We hope to see you there. Get your tickets now. www.paracon, P-A-R-A-C-O-N-N dot org. Paracon, Connecticut's first paranormal convention. We're back to Weird Science with an update on a story from two weeks ago. Oh, Carrie, the beat has got me. The beat has got me. (laughs) You're so weird. (laughs) Remember Josiame Tamara Sitole, who was supposed to have given birth to decuplets, or 10 babies in one go, in South Africa this month? Well, apparently there might be a decuplet conspiracy. Oh, no. Carrie, why why can't I have anything nice? (laughs) Though the father, Teboho Totsetsi, told reporters his wife had given birth to 10 children, he just days ago released a public statement urging donations to the family be halted until evidence of the baby's existence is produced. Wait, why? He was the one who announced it. Well, Sean, apparently he hasn't seen Sitole or the baby since the birth, as he supposedly wasn't allowed to be there due to COVID regulations. And he has since told police he is concerned about Sitole's whereabouts. This is this is like a really depressing plot line from Arrested Development or a Christopher Guest uh, move. This woman just doesn't want this guy in her 10 children's lives. I don't know. Quote, I appreciate the financial support that we have been getting from members of the public, but I would also like to appeal to the public to stop making money deposits into our accounts uh- until members of the community have seen the babies. Cur- <laughs> currently, Sotsetsi is at his mother's home with their twins. Now, these are their two kids that they already had. They already had two. That's right. Well, I guess they had a tendency toward multiples. And he's waiting to see his supposed 10 new children. Sitole apparently told her husband that she was in the care of a private hospital operated by the company Mediclinic. But Chief Clinical Officer of Mediclinic Southern Africa, Dr. Garrett de Villiers, told Snopes in a statement that, quote, we can confirm that none of our facilities were involved in the obstetric care of this patient or her decuplets. Wow. Wait, so did you say that the father said he has seen the babies? Mm, or he has not he seen? He has not seen the babies. He oh, got it. I thought you meant he saw them at the birth, but then no, not since. He wasn't. A, his wife told him that he wasn't allowed to be there because of COVID regulations. So he dropped her off when she was going into labor and hasn't seen her since. Well, listen, either there's no babies or these babies look not at all like her <laughs> husband. It all does, 10 of them. Yeah, it does seem like something's rotten in the state of South Africa. So we'll be following the ongoing Snopes research to get to the bottom of this 10 tot tale. Nice little Shakespeare there, Carrie. Thank you. <laughs> That's it for this episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Ain't It Scary. And check out our website at ain'titscary.com. You can support the show by supporting our sponsors and becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash ain't it scary. And please subscribe to the show and throw us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We'll be forever grateful. Yep, or just tell a friend about us, steal your friend's phone, and subscribe without them knowing. Whatever it takes, as long as as long as long uh, we're getting the downloads and people are hearing it. Um, guys, also, if you want, we have a ton of fun stuff going on on Patreon, as my beautiful wife just said. Um, and we want to give special thanks to our top-tier patrons, uh, Nate Curtis, Sean O'Donnell, Jared Chamberlain, Maria Ferrante, Robin McCabe, Comfy Mike, and Alex Nakudis, still holding it down with us this week. Thank you so much, um, all of you. Yeah, and thanks again to our guest, my father, Paul Ferrante. Again, you can find him on Amazon under his author page and the T.J. Jackson Mystery Series. The first book in that series that we mentioned today is called Last Ghost at Gettysburg. You can also find Dad at www.paulferranteauthor.com. And uh, come see us, all of us, the whole happy family at Paracon this July 24th and 25th. 
Yeah. Oh, one more thing about Patreon. Uh, we just did an episode with Carrie's father. We're going to do one with Carrie's mother. We're in Florida this weekend with them. <laughs> We're making them work. But that one's only going to be on Patreon. So if you want to hear about some uh, Portuguese superstitions and... Uh, lore and legends. Lore and legends. You got to get at us on Patreon, guys. Got to drop that dough. Show created by Sean and Carrie McCabe. Music by Kyle Ryan. You can find Kyle at his YouTube channel. Music is a verb. See you next Thursday. This has been a production of Longboy Media. Ah!